Uh, we're going to talk for our second focus session now about two modules from our winter quarter curriculum. Again, I want to remind you that we keep talking about these as quarters, and you may not be on a quarter system, and if you're not, that's okay. Um, the modules can be remixed, and they really are modular. So other than starting with the intro module and finishing a term with the end of quarter projects, and we'll meet those two modules in depth a bit more tomorrow morning. But other than bookending your term with those two, you really can't, you really have a lot um, a lot of flexibility with how you organize the rest of the term in terms of how you, you know, which modules you choose and how you order them. I will say, yeah, we will, we will say that um, as you've seen, and we'll see again in a minute here as we go back to the scope and sequence, those colored bands, the way that we have two modules banded together, there are sometimes skills, tech skills in particular, that will bracket two modules. So if you separate those two from each other, and then you say do what would have been the second one without doing what would have been the first one, you might be jumping into make a fancy PowerPoint presentation, but not having done the module that was here are some basics about PowerPoint. So be a little careful. Um, but again, if you at least can keep those banded pairs together, there's a lot of things you can do to move them. That said, we're going to look at two modules that we have written into the winter quarter, and those are personal inventory and career exploration. Our objectives for this session together are essentially to really get a look, get a good close look at those two modules and some of the pieces that are inside of them. But this time, rather than looking more through the online content and the pre-work type content, we're going to be looking more at what goes on in the face-to-face -face part of the class. Um, that said, one of those face-to-face -face activities is a web-based activity, but we'll get into uh, We'll get into the specifics of that in a bit. But just know that for this particular session, we're not going to be looking as much at the, at the Canvas content. We're going to be looking more at what's going on in the face-to-face -face class and how students are, um, what they're doing with that preparation that they've taken from their pre-work. We will also, um, while we're doing that, we'll be looking more in depth at the instructional guide because even though you find that online, that's really what we would consider to be a face-to-face -face piece. It's housed in Google Drive, but that will be where you go to get those um, detailed lesson plans that will walk you through step-by-step, -step, give you handouts and the other resources that you need to run your face-to-face -face class on a daily basis. Thank you. So at the beginning of the first session, I said there's really four puzzle pieces. So I hope that that picture of the first piece looking at Canvas and pre-work and understanding the link to the instructional guide now feels comfortable because we'll bring in a more detailed piece on the instructional guide and how that really guides your face-to-face -face interactions with the students. So for, as Adria mentioned, personal inventory and career exploration are the two modules of the eight modules from the winter quarter that we'll look at. These are banded together. And again, just <clears throat> a reminder, you have the topic, oh, that's okay, <laughs> technology, writing, grammar, and math outcomes for each. So we'll come back to this slide in just a moment, but like we did previously, we'd like you to look at those and think about, oh, the questions. <laughs> oh, okay, sure, no. Yes, yeah, so she's pulled up the full winter uh, scope and sequence here. Page 46, I think, if you'd like to see it. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll see the banding of the two we're looking at are here. And we're going to ask you to look at those and to think about these questions. Again, where do you see the connections and what would be significant about these particular themes being included? So just a couple of minutes to have that discussion at your table and then we'll come back together. Okay, so we can just kind of come back together and get some of your initial responses. So if we think about where do you see the connections between these two? The technology building upon each other, mm-hmm. And the writing. And do you see the do you see the 
connection maybe between the technology and the writing. Right, they're gonna be writing this presentation. Chances are they may have to do something with that too. So yes, again, that scaffolding. There was really a lot of thought and intention put into scaffolding pieces to prepare the students and then let them build upon their skills uh, within these bands. And then uh, looking at the actual topics and themes, does anybody have a thought on why you would see those as being relevant? Yeah. Fabulous. Yeah, kind of that self-reflection and thinking about your own, you know, taking inventory uh, of your own strengths and, and then talking about ex uh, ca career exploration and having a sense of what are some of my strengths and what are some things I might be interested in. Great. Wonderful. So, okay, we are going to take a look at an instructional guide in a little more detail. Earlier, I kind of just glanced over those sections, talked a little bit about the module delivery notes, but we'll take just a few minutes here, not too long, just to go through this, yeah. Oh, that's okay, here. This is gonna pop out to it. Oh. Okay, so the first we're gonna start today is personal inventory. And again, the module overview is a great place to start the first time you're gonna teach something, uh, a unit, just to get a sense of the overall objectives of that, what you're going to be working towards. The outcomes, the CCRs. And another thing, I just touch on this now because it makes sense. Um, this is also a really good snapshot of which particular areas you're gonna be focusing overall in a particular module. So this is actually pretty evenly spread across the content areas, but there are weeks that might be heavier on speaking or heavier on writing, and you can just kind of look here and just get a quick sense of that. So if your students, for example, if this was a heavier speaking and listening week, and you thought, you know, they need some more writing practice, then you know you might be able to go in and support some things if you needed to individualize that for who was in your class and what was happening. Yes, sorry, in the back. So. <laughs> I know. So, I, yes. So, uh, I, yeah, I think this is one of those personal choice pieces. I did. I like paper. I know now the big movement at conferences does everything electronic and no paper. And for me, that is very hard personally. I know there are others who really enjoy that and they like being able just to do things digitally. So, personal choice. I will say I printed everything, I printed every IG. Absolutely. Yep. Yes. And I, yeah, and Judah. Sure, and that's the mark of experience. So after she's worked through it a couple times and getting a sense of what pieces are most useful to her. Yeah, thank you, Drew, that's great. So the module delivery notes, again, I'm just going to highlight here the importance of this. Um, we're gonna get to something later, but within this section, there's a link to it so you can be sure that you can preview it. So it's just a quick access point for you to go to that website and preview it. Um, and then there's always a link to those vocabulary lists that are the online components. So this is another place you can just have quick access to them. If you're not in the Google Drive, you just can click from here. The module to glance, which we, we looked at earlier. And da, 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 da. I'm gonna come down here. Okay, so basically the instructional guide starts here. And likes and dislikes is the name of the subtopic and it will always be in bold. So that's something like, because these are based on a template, after you start to realize the conventions of it, I can just scroll through here quickly 
and find, okay, there's a bold, that's a day. And then I scroll down to the next bold. Okay, that's the next day. So um, the very first thing under that will be a reminder of what they did in Canvas, just the name of the activities. And if there was a learn activity and they got new vocabulary, the 12 new words will also be right here. So if you do have this either open on your computer or a printed out copy, you, you also just have quick access to what those words were. And then it'll get here in the green face-to-face -face two hours. And you will notice that every class starts with a warm-up, which is 10 minutes. A couple of them are 15 minutes, but mainly 10. So you'll notice that the title of the activity is always underlined, and it has an estimated time for completion next to it. So because these were all built for two-hour classes, we wanted to make sure that we were really creating two hours worth of material. Um, just a quick note for those people who are on not five day a week schedules, this was a place where I could trim some time. Because if I was having to do sort of a day and a half of material, I didn't need two warm up activities. So I might pick the one that I liked the best or I might merge them in some way or maybe I skipped the warm up that day because I needed that time to get really into the meat of the application. So that's a place you can kind of have a little more um, flexibility with, I'd say, if you're having to reconfigure that. And then directly under that, you'll see materials needed. This has none. And then activity description, which is a step-by-step -step explanation of how to deliver that content. So you can take it as is, or you can kind of find your own way within that. But it is, at least it is there for you as a starting place. Uh, so, and then I see I have the next one. It's underlined. I know that's my next activity for 30 minutes. Materials needed. And here I have a link. So the link tells me there's a handout. So I can just click on this here. It'll take me to the Google Drive directly to this handout, and you could just print it out here. And I'm just going to mention now, because this is also sort of personal preference, some instructors really liked just going through the instructional guide and printing directly from these links. This is what I need for the next class, and I'll just get them here. And there were other people who liked to go to that face-to-face -face folder at the beginning of the week. I printed every handout, and then as I walk through the instructional guide, I just kind of put them face down so they were in order. You know, so there's different, different ways that people were implementing that. But yeah, just a reminder that there's the two places to find it. Yeah. Sorry, I had to interject because sometimes this comes up as a question that does not get answered for a long time, and I want to make sure we get there. Um, so you know there are two places to find those handouts. A key difference between them is just the way that they're organized in those two places. So in that face-to-face -face components folder, those handouts appear in order, in alphabetical order by the title, right? But it, there's no context to tell you how to teach them or what to do with them. So if you just went there for your handouts, you might have a dozen or 15 handouts, but no instructions, but you would find those instructions in here when the activities come up. When you find them in here, yes, you have to scroll for them, but whenever you do find one, you know exactly what to do with it. So neither is better nor worse, just, it's just a different way. Okay. Yeah, no, very true, very true. <laughs> so you can just keep scrolling down. Okay, I see an underline. There's my next activity for 20 minutes. I have a handout. And going down again to the next activity, this class has quite a few activities. And then I get to one that says preview canvas, 15 minutes. As soon as I see that, I know I am at the end of the day because each class is bookended by a, war a warm up activity on the front end and a preview at the bottom. And so we have built in 15 minutes for you to do some of the work, these ideas that you've put around the room, to walk through. You might pull it up on the screen and walk through them with the students to be showing them, here's what you need to do tonight. You might be helping them log in to make sure they can and they can access it and show them that. Um, but that's the last 15 minutes of every day. And that is really critical those first couple of weeks or when you have new students coming in throughout. Taking that time to make sure they know where to direct accessing the pre-work, 
Because yes, it's important to encourage them and motivate them and reward them for doing it. But as you're seeing, the navigation on this gets pretty complicated fast just if they're not familiar with how to look through this. So making sure that they know where to find it. And a little later, we're going to give some other strategies that other instructors have used and found successful to help. And maybe we'll have some of our other instructors chime in with what they do as well. Uh, and then we would get to the next day. And again, as, as Adria mentioned, these are all on a template. So each day looks like that. Title of the subtopic, warm up, activities, preview. And then I'm on to the next day. Um, I will also just mention this right now. As the students become just more self-directed uh, over the quarter in understanding how to get to the pre-work, this is also another place where you can save time to a lot to other activities if, again, you're not on the five-day week. Because you know, by week five, my students knew exactly where to go. I didn't need 15 minutes to be showing them. So I gained some of that time to put towards something else. OK. <laughs> So over to Adria. Thanks. All right, I'm going to juggle notebook, mic, and mouse for this one because I got a lot of things I need to say to you about the next activity that we're going to do. But to set it up a little bit, let's take a look just one more time. You've kind of seen this view, and we'll see this view pop up a few times. It's, again, a little bit like looking at the module at a glance, just a different format. Um, we're going to take a look at the module personal inventory. This is the first module in our winter, winter quarter set that you have there, the first module for session two. And we'll, we'll pop over there together in a minute. You don't need to open it just yet. But just to kind of preview the content that's coming, the first subtopic in that module is professions. And this gives us just a quick at a glance view of the activities that students will do both in their pre-work and then in their face-to-face -face class. We can see if we really look at not only the, um, the titles of the, the activity types, but the titles of the activity and the content in the activity, how the pre-work relates into and prepares students for the face-to-face. I will note that in this particular module, I'm sorry, in this particular subtopic, we see read, listen, and do, read and listen, read and listen, read and listen. There's a lot of read and listen. And that's not necessarily typical. You know that there are other activity types. You've seen that there are learn activities. This particular subtopic doesn't have one of those. Um, there are discussions, and we do have a discussion here. That's going to be one that happens in class, though, because it's a follow-up to actually what happens. They're going to do this stuff, come here and do the face-to-face, -face, and then follow up with it with a discussion. So it's kind of a wraparound in this case. But there are read and watch activities with videos. Often, um, sometimes it's just input, but sometimes it's instruction on a tech skill, something like that. Shannon? As a reminder that do in class, this is where that importance, again, we see of publish and unpublish. Because if the student does that at home, they'll try and do it to the best of their ability based on the instructions they see. But because they haven't walked through the other steps before, it, it, it may cause frustration. They're going to be confused. And likely, they're, well, they will have to do it again after that. So again, that publish and unpublish. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> All right. Um, also, there will be practice quizzes, other activity types. So this one, this particular subtopic um, is heavy on the read and listen, but they're not all that way. But we can see that they're going to do the, the first activity there in the pre-work is about professions. So you can see that's more about kind of the content theme, right? And then we can see an activity in the face-to-face -face that relates to that. The next activity in the pre-work is about the B verb. So that's a more of a language focus. And then we can, well, we don't exactly see the language focus mentioned in the face-to-face, -face, but it's certainly embedded in all of those activities. So that's more of a grammar or language input kind of activity. Then we can see the next one, personality types. So that's kind of back to the content theme of this module, this particular subtopic. The next one is about pie charts. So there we can see a math skill, some numeracy coming in there. And then finally, we'll have, we'll have the discussion. 
in their face-to-face -face session, just to um, give a little bit of background on what's going to happen before we get in and do one of the student activities, we'll just take a look and notice that, you know, after the students do their online pre-work, they're going to come to class for what amounts to live practice, application, collaboration, and communication with their classmates and with their teacher. So it's really, you know, they're, they get prepared while they're doing their pre-work, but then this is their opportunity to really get in and practice, really work with the ideas, and really have genuine interpersonal communication that they're mostly not having when they're in that online setting. And of course, that's so critical to their learning. The instructional guide for this particular subtopic in this particular face-to-face -face session includes these activities. The warm-up on professions is a short one, of course, just 10 or 15 minutes, but takes students through um, just exploring a question about what kind of person is a good teacher? What kind of person is a good electrician? What kind of person is a good mechanic? You know, what kinds of personality traits might support or lend themselves to um, just making a particular career a good fit, an actually legitimately good fit for a person um, and the type of person that they are. The career test is an online career inventory tool. And I mentioned earlier that one of the things we're going to do in this session is experience a student activity that is a web-based activity, but it's, an, it's a face-to-face web-based activity, and you'll very quickly see why in a couple of minutes when we get into that one. As a follow-up to that, students are going to review the results that they get from doing that inventory tool, and those results will include a pie chart. So the pre-work that they've done on understanding what a pie chart is, what that represents, how it works, it's getting them ready to process information that they're going to get, personally relevant information that comes in the form of a pie chart, and they'll discuss that in pairs. So that'll have more a communication aspect. And then finally, we preview Canvas, and again, this is just built into the ending of each face-to-face -face session some time to be able to walk through what's going to happen in that, in that next um, set of pre-work. And Shannon's talked about different ways that instructors will structure that for their students. All right. So we're going to take a little time now to explore an in-class activity from this module. Students will use their computers for this, again, web-based task, but it's really very intentionally placed in the face-to-face -face class and is not given as pre-work. Students will need some support to complete this activity, and by completing it in class, they can get access to this meaningful, personally relevant information, and also practice with a math skill, and practice the, a language skill. So they're getting a whole bunch of things really richly layered together, and it wouldn't come off the same way if they just tried to click through and do this online web tool on their own at home. There'd be a lot that would be missed, and it, it really would not have as much to offer them. So we'll get in and take a look at this and how we can deliver that for students in a way that makes it, that maximizes the um, positive effects of it. In the instructional guide for personal inventory, I'm going to ask you to find the instructional guide section, and that is, you know, further down the page. So let's take a, a little bit, if you're not already in that module, let's get into that module. So I'm going to get into the personal inventory module. I'm going to scroll down past likes and dislikes and past personal characteristics to the professions subsection. That's the third one. No, no, I'm sorry. We're looking at professions subsection, but actually I want to get into the, the uh, instructional guide, don't I? Sorry about that. So we're going to click on that Google Drive folder and take ourselves to the instructional guide for personal inventory. Once I'm in my personal inventory instructional guide, I'm going to scroll down to find
to find the um, instructional guide section with the step-by-step -step instructions. One way that I can find that quickly, um, besides just scrolling down, and I can tell you that it's on about page 11, I think, of this document. If I scroll down to page 11, I can find it. But another way that I can find that information is by clicking on this view at the top of my uh, Google Doc. And if I look at the document outline, I can see an outline that pops up in the left hand side. And then I can get more, obviously, an outline view. So I can scan through. I see the CCRS. And then as I go down, I can see, OK, there's a the personal characteristics subtopic. I'm looking for the profession subtopic. So once I see that, I can click on it, and it will just take me right there to page 11. So that's just another place to look for that information. In general, I like real estate on my screen, so I tend to keep that outline closed. But it can be a useful tool for, for just um, scanning to the place you need to find. If the outline is not showing for them, you go, again, you go to the view, do show document outline, and you can see that outline pop out over there. Okay, You can scroll down, and you're just looking for headings. So I see personal characteristics. That's a subtopic. And I'm looking for the profession subtopic. Another way to get here is just to use my scroll bar on the side and go to page 11. And that's where the profession subtopic will start. All right. So I'm going to, I will go back to the slide view in a minute, but I do want to just get you started on finding a couple of things in here. We're going to do a little bit of hands-on exploration. And so there are some handouts that I'm going to ask you to also pull. If you have your printed copy of your conference book, we're, the first handout that we're going to look at is uh, begins on page 15. It's actually a four-page handout. It's multi-step activity. So it's going to be from pages 15 through 18. I will also find it and display it up here. I could display it by going to Canvas, but since I'm in the instructional guide already and I'm looking at the face-to-face -face portion of this subtopic, I can scroll down and I'm looking for the handout called Career Test Handout. So under this activity that says Career Test, I'm going to click on the Career Test Handout. Again, you have this on page 15 in your conference book. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. I'm going to pop back for just a minute. I do want to point out something to you that's a little bit different about this subtopic. I, I mentioned already that in this subtopic, there was a lot of read and listen in their pre-work. Another thing that's a little bit unusual about this particular session, this particular face-to-face -face session, is that there really are only two activities. There are often several more, maybe, you know, maybe five or so. But in this particular face-to-face -face session, we have only a short warm-up just to help them remember some of the profession vocabulary that they got. And then there's the preview at the end. In the middle, there are only two activities. And this is a two-hour session. So that gives us another view into, oh, I see this four-page handout. <laughs> and it's multi-step. So we can really see that this is one of those activities that's going to go pretty deep. Um, but it's, it's well, I think the payoff is big, but it's really worth following the steps and making sure that you really understand the steps and how to deliver this activity effectively. So when we take a look at this career test handout, and I'm going to go to that one now. Do you have this handout now accessible to you somewhere? 
career test handout page 15 and I'll show it up here on the screen as well. I'll blow it up a little bit. All right. So I'd like to actually just walk through this handout kind of quickly. Um, stick with me and I'll let you know. <laughs> I'll let you know when to click. All right. So the career test handout has some directions. I'd like you to notice that there's a before section. There's a take the test. So that's kind of the during and some basic instructions for the students. And then there's what they're going to do after they take the test. Following that, it says stop here. <laughs> and it's important. We want them to stop here. Um, but you as the instructor also want to know that. We're going to stop here because we're going to take a brief step away from this handout and go look at another handout um, to look at something else and then kind of come back and stitch things together. The career test that they're going to look at is also linked in the instructional guide. So when we talk about this before, during, and after, um, that's linked for you in the instructional guide. It's listed here on the handout, and this happens to be a clickable link, though the students are going to have it on paper, so it's not clickable for them. It's touchable with a finger, but that doesn't help a lot. All right. Um, but this is something where we might recommend either that you paste this link into a line in the module. Um, keep it unpublished until it's time, but you could, you could paste it in and just add a link there for students to click or um, paste it into a message that you can send them via their Canvas inbox. Just something that you, that you can do to limit the amount of time that needs to be spent trying to have students correctly type a URL that's 30 characters long. Because you know a space will get in there or one wrong letter and then it, it just takes a lot of time. So if you can make this clickable for them, it, that's advisable. Anyway, so students will um, get into that career test. What we're going to do right now together is just actually take a quick look at that career test. We don't actually need to complete the test. Um, I know that some of you either already have or will right now, even though I'm telling you you don't need to, because it's fun and you start to look at it and you can't help yourself. I understand that. But from here, I'm going to say you don't have to click through and complete it um, because the idea is we just want to get a preview, an overview of the general sense of the activity. And then I'd like to look at what happens offline related to this activity more than the online. But this is sort of the backdrop for it. So. Students will, as they walk through this, um, there are some instructions here that are written for a native speaking audience. You'll notice that in the handout we gave some ESL level 1, 2, 3 instructions for the same task. Um, but again, this is something that we're doing together in a face-to-face -face setting. So there are 15 pages like this one. We can see at the bottom it's marked one, one out of 15. And so each page is going to show four either jobs or four tasks, work tasks, and ask students to select the one that they like the most and the one that they enjoy the least. So I might look at these going to the office, research job, construction and engineering, and creative photography. Let's say maybe I like going to the office most, so I'll click the check mark and not so into construction, so I can do an X for that one. And then I'll click next and just advance to the next page where I'll see four more, four more, et cetera, until I get to the end. There are different ways that you might deliver this just depending on, depending on your setting, depending on your audience. Um, we, we could do this all of us together with the instructor and all of the students and we just do it as a group. So we kind of get a group personal inventory. It's not really personal, it's more of a group personality inventory. Um, what should we all say? What do you want to do? And then we're just sort of doing it as an example, right? Um, another way to do it would be all of the students have their computers open and I have mine showing on the screen and we talk through each page and we pause and everyone clicks what's meaningful to them. So I'll click my answer, you can click your answers, and then we'll go to the next frame together. So we sort of go through it in lockstep. Or if it works for your group and or if you have maybe enough 
support, maybe some volunteers who can help by perusing from behind so they can see what's going on on the students' screens. Maybe you can just have all the students work through it on their own at their own pace, and then we'll come back together at the end. So you can see there's different ways you could deliver it, but the general idea is we're going to click through this test. Once we finish this, yes, please. Um, again, th this test, the link to this test is in those module delivery notes. And just another reminder to look at those because it was quite important for, I think, all of the instructors to preview this before they just opened it and know they don't need to read those instructions and the importance of clicking one X and one check mark because we had a lot of students, well, at least in my class, it's not working, it's not working, it won't let me go to the next one. And I immediately knew, oh, do you only have one choice? Because if they can't decide and they're trying, I'll come back to this, it doesn't let them advance. So again, I just want to point back to the importance of those module delivery notes and, and really the, um, the need to preview those. <laughs> Yes, that was actually the very next thing I wanted to say. It's, you know, it's exactly, you do, those module delivery notes can be very useful, but also just knowing that module delivery notes or none, walking through each of the activities that you find in Canvas, and certainly with these external tools, just making sure that those links are still live. I'm, I'm grateful that this career test still exists online. Um, back at the beginning, we originally had two different similar kinds of inventory tools um, and we, we chose to go with this one because it, it seemed to be a better fit for the nature of the project and for our audience. But if it were gone, well, we'd have to, we'd have to go back to the drawing board. But you would also want to know that. So by clicking through, you can make sure that when it's something external, you can make sure it's still there and still live and that you know how it's going to work for the students. Yes. Yeah, that's a great question. Right now, um, after all of the sort of revision process has been gone through pretty exhaustively, there are no current plans to update. But most of the things that are in here are all under, the, they're all produced by the project and they're all sort of under our control, right? There are a few links to external things. Um, and, you know, with those things, you'd find it and you just say, well, I'm either going to remove that link from my additional resources because that one's not there anymore, or I'm going to substitute something. That's the places where you're most likely going to find external tools. It's just in that additional resources link that's at the bottom of each module. And th those are fairly easy to either just remove or find a substitution. Yeah. Um, and then for all the things that are really housed in Canvas, those shouldn't be changing really because they're all just created by us. Yeah. But all of that said, if you were to find that something is broken, doesn't seem to be working, there's as you work through this, you're going to find that there are certain things that are more of a canvas question and certain things that are more of an idea question. If it's an idea thing, it's about the idea content, um, then those questions would be best directed to Jody, and you'll, you have her contact information everywhere, and you'll also, I think, get her card tomorrow if you don't already have one, but her contact information is everywhere, and she would be your main point person, and then, you know, she'd either try to fix it, ask a question, direct you somewhere. Um, if it's a Canvas issue, a Canvas question, that's a, that's a something to communicate with Canvas, and they have excellent help tools, help guides. Um, that'll be something that you'd find out more about when you do some type of a Canvas training, but just quickly in Canvas, I can show you that the very bottom item on that far left menu bar is a help link. And they have excellent online support documents. They're called the Canvas Guides. And there are just heaps of things there for students, also for instructors. And they're very responsive if you ask questions, if you make requests for feature updates and things like that. So yeah, so that's a really two-pronged answer, a super long answer, but I wanted you to have that, that there's, there's Canvas stuff and there's idea stuff. So all right. So let's go back to this handout, yeah? Oh, I'm sorry, I see a furrowed brow. Do you have a question? This inventory tool? 
It is. Yeah. Is is there more of a question? <laughs> or is there something more I can say? That I only gave a yes, no answer, but. Interesting. Well, we'll, we'll, let, we'll continue on and see. It didn't, maybe it didn't pop out for you. Or maybe, I don't, I don't want you to leave your profession, but you might want to consider what it's trying to tell you. <laughs> very interesting. <laughs> That's very interesting. Okay. Well, we're back into, so we were, we were in this career test handout, just a quick review. We did the before, take the test. Students finish their test. After they do their test, it says stop here and don't do anything more with that test stuff. So it asks us to then use a pie charts handout. So I want to direct you there. It says use the pie charts handout to practice reading the test results. This is a student handout. And the next one we're going to look at is a student handout as well. The pie charts handout is in your conference book on page 19 through page 21, and I'll pull it up here as well. I'm going to pull it up by scrolling down to it from inside the instructional guide. Under career test results activity, I can see the pie charts handout. I hesitate to zoom on this one because I think I want us to be able to see more of the page rather than see it larger. So this is an activity we're going to sort of stop from doing the career inventory, or sorry, the personal inventory tool. And we're going to take students out now away from what was this kind of very personally relevant, click here, click here, this is what I like, this is what I don't. They're really engaged in talking about their own likes and dislikes. Now we're going to just put that all on pause and go look at this pie chart activity. This is meant to be um, something to help them practice processing that information that they got as some input in their pre-work. Um, they learned about pie charts in their pre-work and now we're going to see an example of it that looks like the, res the personal results they're going to get. But before they get into analyzing their own personal results that'll be different for every single student in the room, we can take a minute to look at an example where every student in the room is looking at pie chart that is the same. So we're all looking at the same one. So we're not getting confused. Like mine says 17, mine says 24, mine says 87, right? We're all looking at the same one first and making sure. So you did that in your pre-work. Do you understand? And we can talk about. So we've got an activity here. I'm going to give you just a few minutes to take a look through this activity. This is the pie chart handout. There are three pages to this handout, and I'll ask you just to look through it. If you have a paper copy, you can do it physically with your pencil. If you're looking at it on a screen, don't use your pencil, but still you can look through and get a sense of the task that students would be doing. I'm going to stop talking for a minute and let you do that.
Hello, everyone. Did you have a chance to look through that pie charts activity? And that one is the, again, that's a pie chart that's sort of generic. It's related to someone else, but not your own pie chart. Um, so the students have gone out and done that pie chart activity. Again, that's a student handout. But as we come back into their career test handout, now we can pick up where we left off when it said stop here on my career test handout. Career test result. After you finish the pie chart handout, use your computer again. Look at the career test result page from the website to find your test result. They're going to walk through some steps to read about the personality types and write one or two words that will help them understand the meaning of each of those types based on what they found in Canvas, what they see described on the results page. And um, so they can continue to work through this activity. What I'm going to give you a little bit of time to do, again, is to review this results this results section, um, take a look at the end part of this activity. And you can either use, um, as your kind of data for, for doing this activity, you can either use your own results if you went through and did the test, even though you didn't need to, I know you did. Or if you didn't do the test on your own, we do have a link for one extra set of results that would be, um, it's just a sample set. That's not one you'd give to students. I actually think it might be a screenshot of my results from one time of taking this test. So if you need a sample set of results to use, you can find one in your conference book on page 22. Or I can pull it up here. It's called the career test results example. That's just a workshop handout. Students wouldn't need this one because they'll have their own. But if you need a sample set of results, you could <laughs> use these. All right. So please, on your career test handout, take a look at that final section called career test result. That's the final section. And look through those questions in light of your own test results or the sample test results, just to get a sense, again, of the task and what students will be asked to do with that.
All right, everyone, let's come back together if you're ready. I see, I'm starting to see you take maybe other inventory tools from the same website, so I hope you've had a chance to um, process what would have been useful for you about the one where we started. Um, so this was a very quick trip through a uh, you know, a pretty in-depth, multi-part, multi-step activity. Um, and the amount of time that we dedicated to it here from our vantage point and from our perspective is not as much as we would invest in it for students, um, but we're taking certainly a different perspective. But I hope it gave you a chance um, to, I guess, to get a look at that tool and to maybe think about how we can use a tool like that and how we can sort of scaffold and structure an in-class activity to support students and give them access to what could be some really interesting and personally relevant information that wasn't necessarily uh, created with them in mind, but why shouldn't they have access to it? And so if we can work on something like that together, again, I said, oh, you'll know immediately why it's not pre-work. It's not pre-work. But by having multiple steps and being able to stay together and do um, kind of just, just process some things and give, give instructions and give support where needed, hopefully we can give students access to that kind of content that might not have been available to them otherwise. Hmm, so I'm going to ask you to think about a couple of questions here. And one is, what do you foresee students gaining from not only this tool, but just from a personal inventory module in general? You know, we, we have the personal inventory and then a career exploration module. And what do you foresee students getting out of spending a full week or more maybe, depending on how you choose to structure um, the way that you go about doing modules? What do they gain from spending time looking at personal inventory as a theme? And then how might this help to scaffold their learning and their experience into that following module, the follow-up of career exploration? Do you have thoughts on this? Yes. Okay. Because the camera's not on you. But no problem. Okay. So sometimes students are just too busy with their lives to take the time to even reflect or think about what they would be good at or what they want to do. And so taking the time to actually think about it, meditate on it, talk to other people, explore is going to help them in the long run for sure when they don't have that time necessarily outside of class. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, and I think for ESL students, they don't, they, many of them come from career uh, uh, cultures where their career was determined by their parents or by their economic, socioeconomic class. So this, this whole idea that you can take an inventory, it might tell you, give you some different information. You could choose a job that you like or have passion about is a, is a really exciting concept for some students. Thank you. Other thoughts, other reflections? Well, I was just thinking that another step in sca you know, scaffolding from here would be to influence their reading and maybe writing by some site like, um, uh, not the Department of Labor, but the D Labor Statistics site, right, where they can see all these different uh, occupations and get little videos of people doing them and read about them and so forth, you know. Very good. That reminds me of a career bridge website that we had, careers.wa.gov or something like that, right, where you can see that kind of information, um, see examples of uh, what types of tasks might be involved in a job and what the path might be like, the educational path to get to that job, um, some steps like a kind of career ladder sort of approach. So yeah, great, thank you. Other reflections on this, these questions? Okay. Great, well I really appreciate what you've mentioned about, you know, just giving students, uh, giving them an opportunity to stop and think about who am I and what what might actually fit me? What goes with my personality, the things that I'm good at or the things that I enjoy doing? Um, uh, we heard 
one thought that, you know, students may come from a culture or a setting where their career was decided by their parents or by their social class, but also they're now living in a different place where their career may, may be decided by their position and their role as an immigrant in their community um, or by what they see their, maybe their, their country mates doing. Um, I've had a number of students who will say things to me like, I want to um, get my certificate in CNA. I want to be a nursing assistant. Oh, I'll say, is it, do you have some background in that? Are you interested in science or have you worked in medicine before? No, I want to do that because she did it, she did it, she did it. And it's like they've learned what their surroundings will allow for them. And okay, maybe, but maybe there's something else. Do I see another hand coming? Yeah, I'm going to bring this to you. No, I was just thinking, oh, sorry. I, I work in the prison. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I was just, the more we talked, I'm saying it gives our inmate students other options. So many of them have been so busy managing their lives, breaking the law, and end up being in prison that they don't really think that there can be another, an alternative life for them. So this is really a good you know, like platform for them to start thinking, hey, when I do go out there, you know, what kind of legal fields can I get into? Yes, yeah. exactly. Oh, because some of them, they say, some of them, why do I even need a GED? I make more money selling drugs. You know, it's just like, which is really true. But that it gives them other options. And, you know, and I, I do appreciate yeah. this. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate that comment. And whatever it is that might be limiting our students or bringing their, making their path very narrow, this is just something, hopefully, talking about this kind of topic that can just expand those horizons. It's a little bit of a cliche, but I can't think of a more appropriate way to describe it here. All right, thank you so much. We're going to move ahead and look at another module. So, Shannon. Actually, several of those comments were a really perfect segue to moving on into career exploration because I think part of that personal inventory and identifying some new jobs or sometimes it's just horizon broadening. I haven't heard of that before. I didn't know I might be good at it or I'd like it as they get a chance to learn more about them. And the other part of that question was sort of how does that sort of then bridge over into this particular topic? And I think you guys touched on that beautifully because now we're really going to start looking at career exploration and what does that really look like? So kind of that internal reflection and then how can I apply that to the world here? So, excuse me, I'm just gonna come over this way. So <laughs> we're going to be looking uh, today, well here at the subtopic of occupations. And we can see that online they're doing their pre-work and this one has a lot of very different types of activities. So we have the learn, discuss, read, listen and watch, practice, and then another discuss. We can see that we're going to be introducing here the past simple, which obviously would make a lot of sense when we're talking about our career experience and our past job experience. Just a, just a quick question, what kind of an icon would be on a learn? Remember in Canvas there's the little pictures? Rocket ship, perfect, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> so then they're going to do their pre-work and come in, and in that last um, activity, somebody asked me, they were looking through the career test, and they saw that students were being asked to write simple sentences with the verb to be. And she just wanted to confirm that indeed, they had learned to be in the pre-work, which, yes, We've been mentioning this intentionality of the blended nature of this as a curriculum. Nothing is separate. So there's not an expect. if it's not introduced, there's not an expectation that they will, will know it and be practicing it in the class. So past simple, if I see that in the pre-work, I know they're going to be doing that in the class, right? There's going to be some sort of a supportive assignment for that. And so here we have the face-to-face -face activities. Um, look at those a little closer. So in this face-to-face -face session, again, our bookends, we have our warm-up and our preview. And they're going to be looking at, in the warm-up, they're going to be doing a matching game. So where they're walking around and matching definitions with types of jobs, which is a reinforcement of vocabulary from the learn that they did. They're going to be doing, what jobs are there? And this is one, again, I point you back to those module delivery notes, because if you have access 
to employment data in your region, your state, or even if you look at the national level, you can gather those items and be prepared for this activity to talk about the true and real openings in your area. Uh, and if you don't have access to that, I, I've talked with people from some areas that didn't have access to that data, you, you could talk about what kind of jobs are you all interested in as a group. But here they're kind of delving into what, what's the reality of the job situation? What jobs are we seeing here? And then moving into simple past tense practice. Then they're going to do a reading about careers and they're going to identify the past simple within that reading. And then you're going to be looking at what they'll be doing next in Canvas. So again, a very intentional connection between what you saw them doing in the pre-work and then what's going to be following is application in the classroom. So hopefully, you guys are starting to feel a lot more comfortable and seeing how quickly you're navigating to these activities that we're saying, I think you are, um, seeing how these face-to-face -face pieces interact with what they've done online. But we'd like you to have a little more opportunity to explore that. So in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to go to the career exploration in Canvas. You're going to open the module you need to go to the instructional guide. So please, on that blue link at the top, you're going to pop out to the instructional guide. And then you need to find the subsection titled Occupations. So career exploration topic, and, uh, excuse me, module, and then occupations subtopic. And what we'd like to do is have you just uh, take some time to preview the activities and the instructions, walking through the step-by-step -step, uh, instructions for the activities for that day. And, oh, sorry. Oh, she's giving you a heads up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, as you're looking through there, please take into consideration these questions. What kind of preparation is provided? in the online pre-work for the section. So we talked a little bit about that, but you can maybe, if you want to look at Canvas and look at what those actual pre-work activities look like, you could walk through it. What materials will you need for the face-to-face -face se session? So are there handouts? Is there anything that needs to be prepared beforehand? And then how will you teach the face-to-face -face activities? So please just take some time to look through those steps and then we'll come back together. Okay, let's just go over some of these. And I, I pulled up this slide just so we had the side by side. Uh, connections between online and face to face, I think we talked about a little earlier. But I don't know, did anybody have a chance to go back into Canvas? Did you take a peek at what they were doing in there? Yeah? Okay, great. I mean, then um, what materials will you need for this face to face? And I'm going to go back to my instructional guide. What kind of materials are you going to need to teach this? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Past tense handout. <laughs> I'm trying to get down there. Okay. Okay. 
Great. Large piece of paper, job titles handouts, past tense handout. Yes, we've got past simple tense, the regular past simple, and common irregular verbs all together on that one activity. Coming down. And then the career reading handout. And then you'll be previewing. Great. So hopefully you all saw in the materials needed, there's links to anything you'll need. Did anybody look in the module delivery notes to see if there was anything you needed to prep? I see a head nodding back there. Yeah. Potentially outside speaker. Uh-huh. So you'd want to do that before <laughs> walking into the class and then thinking, yeah, let's go with that. Um, yes, absolutely. Shannon has given, I've heard her give the really good advice, and I haven't heard it yet today, so I'm going to give her good advice. Um, she likes to actually, at the beginning of a quarter, just print out the module delivery notes for the quarter all of them, just so that she'll have that. Because some of those things are, just do this the day before class. But some of them are, get a guest speaker. And you may want to do that several weeks before the class. So it, that can be a good idea, just to grab those module delivery notes and just take, take care of those from a very early point. Yeah, no, no. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad that we <laughs> I, was say, I do. I do print out the instructional guides at the beginning of the quarter for the modules I'll be teaching and then just scan those. Equally, I open everything in Canvas, as I mentioned earlier, and scan down for in-class activities and unpublish those. So some things that you can just do that take 10 minutes at the start of class and will avoid a lot of frustration midstream. Oh, the question was, how will we gain instructor access? So through all of these training modules and tomorrow the two that we do, you are going to be in as a student. And then when we go to the final session yes, uh, yesterday, oh my gosh, when we go to the final session tomorrow, uh, yeah, you, you will be shown, you are technically already a teacher within this canvas, but we'll be showing you how you activate a new class, and then you will start pulling in the modules, and you can choose the ones you want, and then you'll have all that functionality. Yeah, I just want to keep reminding you, because you don't see it there, that when you do see it, there's a couple key pieces you want to have in mind. Um, something earlier uh, also that, that we didn't get a chance to talk about in the last one is something called the pre-published checklist. So as I'm thinking here right now, what do I do at the beginning of the quarter? Tomorrow they will show it to you. It is also, there's a copy in your booklet that you can look at. But there are some necessary items that you do need to complete before the start of every quarter. Some of those are administrative tasks uh, within Canvas and some of the settings. Some of those are pieces that you need to edit. For example, there is a syllabus provided, but obviously you need to personalize that to your school or organization's personal details, your contact information. And so there's just um, a checklist of items for you to walk through and do. So, you know, if you've just got a couple hours, I say a couple hours, that's really overestimating. I mean, when, especially once you know what you need to do, you can kind of walk through, walk through those items and it will save you a lot of frustration midstream. And then I, I guess the question says, how will you teach this? And I'm going to ask if anybody had other ideas, because really, right, how you will teach this is laid out for you. You are given, you are given a full lesson plan that you can just work from. But obviously, as a teacher with experience, you come in with your own strategies and your own toolkit, and you can enhance pieces of this. Or there's been some conversations that I've had, but what if this, this is not going to work for my students? For my students, they're not going to be interested in these particular jobs that you've put up there. That's the beauty of this being open source. You can change it. You can update those jobs to reflect what your students are going to be interested in, what's available in your area. So, don't be afraid of going in there and inserting your own personal experience and your own approach to things, um, making sure that it's going to work the best for your students, you know, that, that, that you have the ability to go in there and make those changes. Did anybody want to make any comments on, on this particular subtopic? Anything you wanted to add?
You were going to. Um, yeah, sometimes, depending on the level of student I have, is this something that for the group that I have, we're kind of reviewing, perhaps they have learned it before. Um, it does recycle back through, you know, things kind of corkscrew back. So somebody who's been in your class for the three quarters has seen this more than once. So also thinking about, is this something coming up in which quarter that that student's been involved in the makeup of my class? If I feel like that's something they need more work on, then I'm going to need to supplement for that. So I think it's just, it depends on the makeup of the group in my experience. But I do supplement when needed, you know, if they needed more practice with that. And, and warm-ups are a great time. Oh, yeah. Which is also, just to coming back to, so I had three day, three hours for three days, so I still had the nine hours, but um, when I had to rework where I was saying like warm-ups were a great place for me to kind of gain some time to apply somewhere else, grammar would be a great place for me to do that. So if I had, if I was overlapping with two, I might find an activity that I already had and I loved and then supplement what was there, taking that time uh, from that, but still using the base of what was there and then just enhancing it. So then just, if we could just quickly look at these also, what do you see your students gaining from the career exploration? So you thought about personal inventory a little bit of g ago, and now that's kind of morphed into this career exploration and how this might benefit your students. I, th I think it gives them vision of things like we've, we've said they may not have thought about before, especially if you have a guest speaker. Um, I think it'd be great if you could get a previous student that would come in and say, look, I'm at college now, I've taken these classes, so they can see that what could be ahead for them if there's opportunities there. And also that obviously they've had a change in circumstances because they're here, they're new. But a change in circumstance does not mean that you're stuck um, and that uh, there are different avenues that could be available uh, to you. Or now that you've had this change in circumstance, how can you uh, kind of turn it to your advantage to explore and get to know yourself a little bit better so you can better prepare for um, the challenges that are coming ahead? I just want to say I love that comment about look at the advantages that might be coming with this change. I really like that. I thought I saw two more hands over here. <laughs> we're just going to have it go around here. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> well, I want to piggyback on what you were saying that it gives them vision. Because as I said earlier, I work uh, in a prison. And every so often during our graduation ceremony, we do invite graduates who are former inmates who had done real well outside. So when they come back and they say, hey, education made a lot of difference for me because I'm working here, I'm working there, and I'm doing these kinds of things. And in fact, one time, one of the graduates or one of the keynote speakers who used to be a, a student inmate said, you know, prison, you know, I, he was working in horticulture, he was taking horticulture classes, and he was saying, a seed changed my life, and a seed in education changed my life. And the audience was just like, oh my. And I got so teary-eyed because it was so powerful. And then a lot of our students left that ceremony feeling like, if he could do it, I could do it too. There's hope for me. So, I also love that he used a seed, something so small that could grow into so much more. Did you want to? say that, you know, I was an ESL student a long time ago, and I wish that when I went to college, way back in 1976, whatever, 78, that would have, we would have had better career planning. So I see it as a, you know, for future students where, you know, you're kind of new in the country, and then your ESL is a little bit to the level where <coughs> you could understand what options you have for college, then going through all of these process would help me. You know, I wanted to be an optometrist, but I didn't have enough math. You know, I wanted to be this, but I couldn't do that. So, but kind of focusing on what I like to do or I don't like to do and getting uh, kind of an idea what would be my, you know, my preferred profession would have helped me a lot. Thank you. That's wonderful. Oh, and. <laughs> yeah. 
guided pathways. Yeah. Oh. Guided pathways, especially for helping a lot of, when they turn around and look at that and they're studying ESL. The thing is, a lot of people can't take out student loans and, the thi and, and they're trying to work to forge ahead to help their family. So going in the direction of if they have an interest to turn around and help them plant the seed and help network them onto counseling or whether what type of instructor. So that way they can help them fulfill their dream and see that, hey, how long will it take? And the encouragement of how, what, what needs to happen. So that way they don't go and run around and feel like, okay, education didn't happen for me. So now I'm distressed. My family's going to be distressed. Now my kids won't go to school because I was the production of what didn't happen because I didn't know how to forge ahead. So guided pathways helps them, and especially with what this does is, yeah. Your lesson's been excellent. I like oh, it. Oh, thank you. I'm so glad. I thought you were just going to say guided pathways and like drop the mic. Like guided pathways. That's all I have to say. <laughs> As we're all, you know, really developing guided pathways. I think that's so true. And just, I think we had referenced earlier that, that idea of exploration and what's possible. And I think I spoke earlier over here with the group about professionals who are coming. And now they may have to look at are they able to have the same path? Can they kind of continue on the path with what they were doing from before? Uh, what is the reality of how long that will take? What kind of education is needed? Can they bring over any education? Or do they perhaps want to look at something that's in a related field? That doesn't mean that they can't be in something related. So, you know, looking at what that really looks like now for their situation and giving them those possibilities. So thank you. Those are excellent. Yeah. Well, another thing that I appreciate a lot that I'm hearing come up in your reflections on this is how this is not only about helping our students to find what could be, you know, sort of their their personal tendencies, you know, just sort of their self-knowledge, their self-awareness, and looking for a particular career and a career that's suitable for them. But also, I'm hearing a lot about um, this being a way to for us to help our students hook into and connect with resources that are available to them through our institutions and through other community institutions and organizations. I think that's such a critical part and something that's often missing for the populations that we serve. The, the resources that may be available to them on campus or in the community, um, they're available to all other students, but our students don't necessarily know about them. So this is these kinds of things when we can invite a guest speaker and we can focus on this particular kind of theme for a week, it gives us that opportunity to stop and explore that to the depth that we're going to help students to understand. It's not just on you to figure this out. And I can't tell you everything there is for you to know, but you're going to have questions. And this person can help, and this person can help, and this office can help. So um, well beyond this week, <laughs> you have lots of resources available. So really that, so hopefully now the second puzzle piece of the face-to-face -face and how you're taking what they did online and really applying it with project-based and problem-based application within the classroom feels clearer and that connection, the fact that they're blended, I hope feels like really solid to you that yes, they're definitely uh, working together. Students cannot always do the pre-work and I know in our Q&A earlier, I, somebody had asked and I answered to that. In my experience, the students will do the pre-work even if they're not able to necessarily the night before the class because of life circumstances. But I've heard several people here talking about how their ability to go back and review the information, um, try things again, and also for those students because of other circumstances who can't come consistently to class don't need to fall behind. They can be online and when they come back feel like they know what's going on. So thank you so much. What a wonderful discussion. Thank you very much. So did, uh, the only thing I did want to just briefly, I had said at the beginning that I wanted to talk just a little bit about some different ways that instructors pointed students to pre-work. So all of these ideas, the messaging from minute one, day one of the shift to pre-work is important. And then just kind of putting it in whatever framework, and you came up with some wonderful ideas in the last session. But I did want to show you here what some teachers do. Um, again, as with many of these things, it's personal style. What do you like? What works for your students? Uh, I will say what I do first, then maybe you share, and we can share for some others. Uh, I unpublish the module until we get to it. So I load everything into the course and then if, for example, if personal inventory was week four, uh, I would just unpublish it. And to do that, 
you unpublish at the title level. So here's the title of the module, and you would just unclick this. Um, well, actually, I don't unpublish it. I, I edit. I edit and I lock it. Originally, I unpublished, but then I really had to remember to publish it the day they needed it. Then I discovered this lock and unlock, and you can set it so it was doing it automatically. And my students knew for my class at what time on the Friday that it would unlock for them to be able to view the next one. So I always said to them, my thing was, in here, you can always go back and review after something was unlocked. I never closed it again, but I didn't want them running ahead because they want to do what they can see. They're so motivated and they're so excited, but of course, they haven't prepared yet for everything that's there. So that was one way that I did it. Um, I know th the other way I'll mention is that some people, you'll see here with this little plus sign, I'm not going to do it right now because, again, it will change it for all of the sessions, but uh, you can add in a text header down here, which is what the module titles are. There's no work there. It doesn't open. It's just the, the title. And some people would create one that said start and create one that said stop, and they would just move it because you can, these are movable. You know, you could drag and drop them. So they would just do that. So the student, they left things unpublished, the whole thing, but they would just move this start and stop, and that really helped their students. Do you want to share a couple, maybe? Yeah. So uh, I'll mention one, one of the nice things about um, locking a module as opposed to unpublishing is, is that the students can see what's coming, and that's kind of motivating, right, um, for some of them. They can see what's coming, but they just can't race ahead and do it. Sometimes we need to almost artificially slow them down. It's a process orientation. <laughs> Let's walk through this together. Did you have a question? Yeah. Those are like the stuff I only want to see in the module. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, you can have them only see two because you can unpublish the others. Or we're going to get into this tomorrow when we do our getting started session, which will come at um, you know tomorrow afternoon. That's when you'll find out how to create your own course, how to get modules and pull them in. And you can just pull in the modules that you want. You know, we're, when we talk about these are the fall quarter modules, there are 10 of them. But if you want four of them, just bring four and then that's all. So yeah, so we'll get into that and that's where you'll also get into once you create a course, you're the teacher and you'll be in the teacher role. So we'll get into some of those things. One, just I'll give one more note on a way to organize so students know what to do. Um, Shannon talked about like a start here and a stop here. Some teachers will give um, just a little strip of paper that lists the activities for a particular day. What I do is, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll actually at the beginning of the quarter, I'll go through every item and just edit the title. I don't need to go into the activity itself, but by clicking on the three dots there, I can edit just the title. I just put a number at the beginning. And so my, my class will be numbered like from one to 247 or something. And so when it's time for me to assign their pre-work, I'll tell them do number 75 to 79 and that's it. Um, I don't need to say, open the personal inventory module, go to this subtopic, and then do these three activities, read, watch, and listen, read, listen, and do, blah, 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 blah. You know, it's too much. It's just too much to keep track of. So I say do number 75 to 79, and one way or another they can find that. So that can be helpful. Also, the way that we keep circulating and encouraging you to close modules that we're not using right now. So I really encourage you to work with students on that. Close it, close it, close it. You can always go back and open it, but um, keeping their view as simplified as possible, just as, as uh, limiting the scrolling really can help. So, all right. I'll just add one more because I just recently heard this from an instructor and I really liked it. They took a, I don't know what they had published or unpublished, but they took a screenshot and they just make copies and they, they handed that out. So these are the activities you need to do. So that the student had that just from this view, a screenshot. So I thought that was kind of a cool way too. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for your participation, your great discussion and ideas today. We are going to go back to the original ballroom just for kind of a final closeout session and then enjoy your evening and we look forward to seeing you here tomorrow. Thank you.